without belief. How we fail to criticize or criticize the beliefs of others has more importance to us personally, more consequence to us personally, and to civilization than perhaps anything else that is in our power to influence. So what is belief? Well, beliefs are, are representations of the world, clearly. They're mental representations of the world, but they're not only that. A belief is a representation of the world which is taken to actually represent the world, which is to say it's taken to be true. It, this is what separates beliefs from suspicions or hopes. This is why beliefs can really guide our behavior. You know, we, we all believe that we were meeting here for a talk at 7.30 tonight. Anyone who thought the talk was, was going to start at 8, we'll be wandering through the door in a few minutes. Beliefs organize our behavior. Just imagine the change in you, neurologically, that would occur if, if you came to believe suddenly that this building was about to collapse. You know, someone, it, mere words, someone would just come into the door and say, run for your lives. And if he, if he looked like a plausible version of a fire marshal, you would have a very different state of being emotionally, behaviorally. So that the fact that you're content to even stay seated here at the moment rests very much on what you believe to be true about your, your circumstance. Now, I want to talk in particular about religious beliefs, and this is where we may run into some difficulty, because I'm going to say some very nasty things about religious belief. And some of you may get offended. I know you're a very reformed moderate bunch, but some of you undoubtedly will get offended. I, w I want you to notice this process, the dynamics of it. You know, if I say something and the walls start to go up in you, I, wa I want you to remember just what it was. Presumably I haven't said anything offensive yet and we're still having a conversation, but y as you'll see, I think conversation really is the issue. and what prevents it, what derails it, is really the challenge for us, for us to specify as a species, really. Now, there, there's a taboo here that has already begun casting its shadow over our conversation, and I want to make it explicit before violating it. It is taboo in our society to criticize a person's religious faith. I know, you know fundamentalists complain a lot about having their beliefs criticized, not the way I'm about to criticize them. It's taboo even to notice the differences among our religions. It's taboo, for, in, 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 for instance, to even notice that certain religions lead to violence in a way that others don't, certain religious doctrines promulgate violence. Now, what I argue in my book is that these taboos are offensive, deeply unreasonable. But worse than that, they're getting people killed. And th this is really my concern. My concern is that our religions, the diversity of our religious doctrines, is going to get us killed. I'm worried that, that our, our religious discourse, our religious beliefs, are I ultimately incompatible with civilization. It, it seems to me to be absolutely obvious that there is no future in which nuclear-armed fundamentalist regimes will live side by side with one another and manage to keep the, the missiles happily in their silos indefinitely. People really believe that certain books were written by the creator of the universe. Given the contents of these books, people really believe that death in the right circumstances is the highest good. People really believe that such a death can't come soon enough for themselves, and for, even for their children. People are really motivated by these beliefs. 
So I, I wrote the end of faith because I believe that the, the concessions we have all made, you have all made, religious moderates especially have made to faith in our discourse. These concessions have rendered us powerless to really resist the, the, the encroach of fundamentalism and, there, and therefore religious extremism and religious violence. These concessions, I think, prevent us from ultimately protecting civilization from its genuine enemies. Now, but before I start careening into blasphemy, I want to put something to the fore because you're going to lose sight of it, I guarantee you. I take ethics and spirituality very seriously. I think ethics and spirituality are the, the only game in town, ultimately. They, they lie at the core of what, what is most beautiful and profound and necessary in our circumstance as human beings. But what I'm asking you to entertain is that there is nothing we need to believe on insufficient evidence in order to have deeply ethical and spiritual lives. There's nothing that we, that we need to believe on insufficient evidence to invoke the power of ritual, to build beautiful sanctuaries, to come together as communities. Now, <clears throat> we're all familiar with this notion that you should respect another person's religious beliefs. Your neighbor has the right to believe whatever he wants to about God or the moral structure to this universe or what happens after death. And you should respect these beliefs merely because he believes them. Does, does this sound strange to anybody? Where else do we play by these rules? When was the last time any of us was admonished to respect someone's beliefs about history or biology or geography? You know, if, if someone comes into this room and claims to believe with all his heart down to his toes that Tennessee is on the west coast of the United States, you are under no obligation at all to respect him for it. And you're certainly under no obligation to give him a job as a fighter pilot or an airline pilot. Now, what we do in every other area of our lives is rather than ex respect somebody's beliefs, we evaluate their reasons. If a person's reasons behind his beliefs are good enough and he can articulate them, you will helplessly believe what he believes. That's what it is to be a rational human being. Beliefs are contagious if they're backed up by reasons, except on matters of faith. So, so what is faith then? Now, clearly we use this term in a variety of ways, in, in at least two ways, and, and there, there's only one sense of this term that I'm criticizing. I mean, there's a very ordinary use of faith. We, we talk, for instance, of having faith in yourself. You know, all of us have to live our lives in the context of uncertainty, and this kind of faith is, a, is just a positive orientation toward life. You know, if, if anyone needs a written guarantee before they get out of bed in the morning, that the day is going to go well. They're going to have profound difficulties living their lives. So we, we need to be able to, to work and live in the context of uncertainty and in the context of, of very troubling certainties, like the certainty of death. So there's nothing wrong with this kind of faith. But this is not the faith that has given us religion. The faith of religion is belief on insufficient evidence. Religious faith is the presumption of knowledge that certain facts are true, that certain books, for instance, were written by God or otherwise inspired by God, that certain historical figures were divine or something more than human.
And we, we rely on faith only in the context of claims for which there is no sufficient sensory or logical evidence. Otherwise, you would never think to invoke faith. If you are, if you are standing on the mountaintop and the voice of God is booming at you from the whirlwind, when you come down from the mountain and somebody asks you, why do you believe in God, you are not going to invoke faith. You're going to say, I was there. God spoke to me. I heard him. There is no satisfactory explanation for my experience apart from a supernatural visitation. And that's what I'm calling God. If, you, if your child gets cancer and the doctors say there's nothing that can be done for her, and you convene your church or your synagogue and, you, and the congregation prays over her and she gets better. I can guarantee you that for the rest of your life, if someone asks you, why do you believe in God? That is going to be the first thing that comes to mind. The doctor said she was going to die. We prayed over her. She was healed. Okay, that is not faith. That is a reason. That is an evidentiary frame of mind. That is practically science. It's not good science. It's, it's not a double-blind study. It should be obvious to all of you that there is room for wishful thinking and sheer coincidence to intrude there. But where we have reasons, where we can have a, just even a semblance of a reason, we seize upon them. So one of the things I argue in my book is that no one is content, really, to rely on faith. Faith simply greases the wheels of cognition in the meantime, allowing us to take on board representations of the world that are presumed to actually represent the world. They're presumed to be true. It's presumed that Jesus really was the Son of God or that a cracker literally becomes Jesus if, if you say the right Latin words over it. Or that, or that there is a God who can respond to prayer. And we, we presume these propositions to be true in the absence of sufficient evidence. Now, undoubtedly, there are people in this room who are going to want to say that faith is something else entirely. It's a, an inner knowing. It's a movement of the heart. It is some other kind of esoteric experience. What I'm arguing is that that is not what billions of people on this earth mean by faith. Now, the faith of billions, these in incompatible claims about the divine origin of certain books, this faith has divided our world, has balkanized our world into separate moral communities, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus. This is a problem. These are divisions in the human community over which conflict is inevitably happening. Either you believe Jesus was the Son of God, or you don't. If you do, if you believe that there's no path to the Father but through the Son, it is impossible, logically impossible, emotionally impossible, for you to really respect the beliefs of Muslims and Jews. Those beliefs lead to damnation. When the stakes are this high, when, when calling God by the right name can make the difference between eternal happiness and eternal suffering, it is impossible to respect the beliefs of others who, who don't believe as you do. So this is why the, the, the heretic is actually far more dangerous than the child molester. I mean, the heretic next door by the, if, if he articulates his heresy, stands a chance of damning the souls of your children for all time. If you really believe this stuff, if you really believe that, that a certain book was written by God, it becomes quite reasonable to treat heretics very badly. But what do we do to child molesters? We, we lock them up. 
what, have we, what did we do to heretics for centuries? We burned them alive. This was reasonable, given what we believed. The, the patriarchs of the Western tradition, the, the great men still taught to all college freshmen, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine. In, in Aquinas' case, he thought heretics should be killed. Augustine thought they should be tortured. Augustine's argument for the torture of heretics inspired the Inquisition. Now you may say, you know, we don't torture heretics anymore. But we have secularism to thank for that. We have centuries of secular dialogue, secular politics, and scientific insight. We now know that you know, when the crops fail, it wasn't because a jealous neighbor cast a spell. We know that epileptics are not possessed by demons. We know this by virtue of science. So centuries of, of secular conversation have essentially edited our faith, and even the faith of fundamentalists in the West. But the same is not true at the moment in the Muslim world. Specifically, the crime of apostasy, the, the disavowal of, of your religion, this is still punishable by death everywhere under Islam. Now, how often that, that sanction is carried out is changes from country to country. But the, the fundamental problem here is that it is, is, a, is a normative conception under Islam that disav the disavowal of the Quran, the disavowal of your religion as a Muslim, is punishable by death. You never hear moderate Muslims saying it isn't. Not even Cat Stevens, an ex-hippie rock star, can tell you that it isn't. This is why scarcely a sensible sound in defense of Salman Rushdie emerged from the Muslim world in the aftermath of Khomeini's fatwa. So let's get our bearings here domestically. What do our neighbors believe? What do many people in this room very likely believe? Well, 22% of Americans claim to be certain, certain that Jesus is going to return to earth sometime in the next 50 years. Another 22% believe he probably will do so. This is 44% of the electorate. This is 150 million people in our country. 150 million people believe that a historical figure who incidentally was crucified 2,000 years ago is going to come out of the sky like a superhero and wield his magic powers over the face of the earth, kill all the bad people, and save the day sometime in the next 50 years. Now, this belief, of course, entails other beliefs. It's no accident that 44% of Americans also believe that we were created from dust sometime in the last 10,000 years with no genetic precursors. 44% of Americans want us to stop teaching our children about the biological fact of evolution. 62% actually want us to teach creationism in schools, but 44% want only creationism. Forty-four percent of Americans also believe that the creator of the universe literally gave the land of Israel to the Jews. This is God as an omniscient real estate broker. So one thing I argue in my book is that we are building a civilization of ignorance. And it's not just that we're in danger of losing our technological edge to China, or that medical research may be impeded, though, although those things undoubtedly are happening. Beliefs of this sort have geopolitical consequences. 
forty four percent of americans if they turned on their television tomorrow morning and saw that a mushroom cloud had replaced jerusalem or new york would see a silver lining in that cloud because the that, that cloud would be a portent that the best thing that is ever going to happen is about to happen the return of christ and this is this is not th these people elect not only elect our congressmen and our presidents, they get elected as our congressmen and presidents. We are not talking about the fringes of society. We are, we are quite literally talking about the fringes of the Oval Office, if not its present occupant. So one thing I argue is that this should be terrifying to us. The idea that there's only 50 years left, the idea that there may only be 50 years left, this is perfectly maladaptive. Bad ideas don't get much worse than this. This is perfectly hostile to creating a sustainable future for ourselves, environmentally, even economically. Some of you probably remember the, the story about James Watt, Reagan's first Secretary of the Interior, who said in testimony before Congress, when the last tree is felled, Christ will return. He's the Secretary of the Interior. Now, most secularists didn't know what to make of this comment, but the, the devout certainly did. Reagan is reported to have brought Jerry Falwell into his National Security Council briefings. He had Hal Lindsey, a religious lunatic of the highest order, lecture to the Pentagon about the, the implications of Bible prophecy for nuclear war with the Soviet Union. So, so what is the problem with taking things on faith? Well, there are two, and the first should be very obvious. If faith is what, ha what you have to go on, if faith is the link between your beliefs and the world at large, your beliefs are very likely to be wrong. Beliefs can be right or wrong. If you, uh, if you believe you can fly, that belief is only true if indeed you can fly. Somebody who thinks he can fly and is wrong about it will eventually discover there's a problem with his view of the world. <laughs> Faith does not offer a strong link between our beliefs and actual states of the world. And this is not an accident because it is what we rely on when no such links exist. It is what we rely on when the reasons are not there, when the sensory evidence is not there. But there's another problem with faith, and it occurs between people and between societies. You see, we have a choice. We have two options as human beings. We have a choice between conversation and war. That's it. Conversation and violence. And faith is a conversation stopper. The only thing that guarantees an open-ended collaboration among human beings, the only thing that guarantees that this project is, is truly open-ended, is a willingness to have our beliefs and behaviors modified by the power of conversation. It should be clear, what else could do it? What else could guarantee that our future together of collaboration is actually open-ended? We, we have a consensual space where we continually revise our, our description of the world. New data comes in, new arguments come in. 
Now, failing that, when the stakes are high, we just start clubbing each other over the heads. If there is nothing that a devout Muslim and a devout Christian can say to one another that will put their beliefs about the world in check, that will, that will make them mutually susceptible to the power of conversation, then when the stakes are high, there is nothing to appeal to but force. So now what is it that most people take on faith? There really is this central claim that certain books are unique. Generally, the claim is certain books were written or dictated by God. Among moderates, it may be certain books may have been dictated by God. More moderate still, certain books were written by the wisest people who ever lived, and we can't improve on them. Whatever the claim, it leads certain books to be uniquely venerated. Now the question is, do the contents of these books warrant this? No. Consider, consider the Bible as a source of moral instruction. The, the Bible is undoubtedly a great work of literature, but consider it as a moral document. Consider books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus and 2 Samuel. As moral documents, these are diabolical books. These texts tell us to kill people for all manner of infraction. To kill your children for talking back to you. You kill people who work on the Sabbath. You kill people who have homosexual sex, men at any rate. You kill people for adultery. You kill people for wizardry. The list is long and preposterous. Now, most Christians and Jews imagine that somehow these admonishments were appropriate to the time, that the Canaanites were so ill-behaved that, that a, a prescription like kill your children if they talk back to you was an improvement over the status quo. This is ludicrous. This is historically ludicrous. At the exact same moment in history, people like Mahavira, the founder of Jainism, an Indian religion, and Buddha, incidentally, were, they were preaching highly moral doctrines, too moral. Mahavira, Jainism is, is, is a doctrine of utter nonviolence. His contemporary in the Old Testament Elijah was running around killing the prophets of Baal for their wayward beliefs. These are different moral visions. It was possible back then to realize you shouldn't kill your children for talking back to you. Now here I violated another taboo, or that second taboo I mentioned earlier. It is taboo to notice that our religions are actually different. Our religions are not all equally wise. They're not teaching exactly the same thing on every point. And where they do teach the same thing, they don't teach it equally well. Now, let's linger on this supposed link between scripture and morality, because it, it's often claimed that unless we think one of our books was actually written by the creator of the universe, we will just be at sea morally. We will be practicing cannibalism and having sex with our children. There is no evidence for this. But let's consider a moral question that is solved, at least in the civilized world. Consider slavery. We can all agree that slavery was an abomination. Thomas Jefferson, as good as that man was, he would have been a better person if he had freed his slaves. Absolutely. Anyone who thinks that slavery, in moral terms, still may have something going for it, has been completely marginalized in our society. 
Well, what sort of instruction do we get from the Bible on the subject of slavery? The creator of the universe clearly expects us to keep slaves. This is true in the Old Testament. This is true in the New Testament. Jesus clearly expects us to keep slaves. Many Christians imagine that Jesus has repudiated or somehow rescinded all of Old Testament law. This is untrue. I can assure you that the, the ecclesiastics who were burning heretics for centuries in Europe had read all of the New Testament. But on the subject of slavery, 1 Timothy 6, New Testament, admonishes slaves to serve their masters well. Serve your, serve your believing masters all the better and they thereby partake in their virtue. So if we think this book was written by the creator of the universe, or if we think this book is somehow, even if written by men, unsurpassed and unsurpassable in moral terms, we should own other human beings and make them work for us. The only, guy, the only restraint that God urges upon us on this subject is not to beat them so badly that we knock out their eyes or their teeth. But we can surely beat them. They're slaves, after all. We, we can beat it. We should beat our children, incidentally. Proverbs, Proverbs 23 says, Do not withhold correction from the child. If you beat him with a rod, he will not die. If you beat him with a rod, you will save his soul from hell. Now, I think it should go without saying that any person in 21st century America who's beating his kids with a rod is a bad parent. But if you believe this is the best book on the planet in moral terms, that's the only kind of parent you should be. So there, there's a basic problem here. If we hold these books aside from the rest of the human conversation, make them immune to criticism, if they are uniquely wise, then we are at, at the mercy of their contents. And the problem is exquisitely acute in the Muslim world now, because there really are doctrines in mainstream Islam that are incompatible with civil society specifically the doctrines of martyrdom and jihad. I mean, these are deal breakers. There is no possible future in which aspiring martyrs are going to make good neighbors for us. Now, if, if you think, and being moderates, you're very likely to think this, if you think that Muslim violence is really just a matter of politics, if you think it's the product of the history of oppression and the lack of economic opportunity, you should ask yourselves why we don't see Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers. The Tibetans have suffered an occupation every bit as brutal and far more cynical than any occupation that has been visited upon the Muslim world. Many people believe that 1.2, 1.3 million Tibetans have died as a result of the Chinese occupation. We don't see throngs of Tibetans calling for the deaths of, Chi of Chinese non-combatants. We don't see Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers blowing up Chinese children in their schools. What we do see are Tibetan monks and nuns who have spent decades in Chinese prisons being tortured, who come out and say things like, my greatest fear while in prison was that the pain of torture would cause me to lose the strength of my compassion, and I would start to hate my torturers. Now, find me a Muslim who, after decades of being tortured with an electric cattle prod in an Israeli jail, comes out speaking that way and I will eat my book. I'm serious. It is unthinkable, given what Muslims believe. 
Now, let me be very clear about this. I am not talking about an ethnicity. I'm not talking about Arabs. I'm talking about the logical entailments of the doctrine of Islam. I'm talking about John Walker Lind, the white guy from Marin who went to fight with the Taliban. Now, we may question the wisdom and the desirability of the Buddhist response, the, this emphasis on compassion. Now, I'm absolutely open to argument on this subject. And if you read my book, you'll discover I'm not a pacifist. But what I'm not open to argument on is this taboo that prevents us from noticing the difference between a doctrine of compassion and a doctrine of jihad. The truth is, in the Muslim world, we even see people who haven't suffered much of anything willing to spend their lives trying to figure out how to kill as many non-combatants as possible. You know, Osama bin Laden is really the, the reductio ad absurdum of any argument that suggests that you need to be insane or poor or the victim of oppression to take up jihad. So this is an extraordinary circumstance we're in. We, we have certain religious beliefs leading to the most nihilistic violence. But what, what could be more nihilistic than blowing yourself up in a crowd of children and having your mother approve of it? This is the situation we're in. Now, I really want to nail this down because many of you are, are very likely still to believe, no, 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 Islam is a religion of peace. These are, these are economic and political issues. This is a result of the misadventures of, of American foreign policy. A, a, America has a tremendous amount to apologize for in the world. There is no doubt. But this is a separate issue. Yes, they're related, but this is a separate issue. There is no possibility that we will ever have a problem with Jane suicide bombers. Insofar as a Jane becomes more and more religious, even more and more deranged by his religious dogmas, he will become less and less violent. The doctrine of Jainism is a, is a doctrine of total pacifism. Jains drink every sip of water, observant Jains drink every sip of water through cheesecloth so that they won't sm swallow a bug. They, they sweep the, the path upon which they walk so that they won't step on ants. They can scarcely figure out how to live in this world. They're so nonviolent. So if you don't think religion is the difference that makes the difference, you have to explain the Jains. So where does that leave us? We have the situation where religious beliefs are inevitably dividing one community from another because they're incompatible. We have religious beliefs and the, and the sheer divisions among communities leading to violence. And the most reasonable people in our societies, societies in the West, moderates and secularists, are constrained by taboos from talking about this. We have really medieval superstitions deciding social policy in 21st century America. And what I argue in my book is that we cannot sufficiently criticize the encroach of medievalism and the spread of fundamentalism because of the lip service we pay to faith, because of the validity we accord it in our discourse. There's no one in the, one in the White House press corps who can stand up when the president says something like, we need common sense judges, I'm quoting now, we need common sense judges who realize that our rights are derived from God. 
And these are the kinds of judges I plan to put on the bench. Okay, no one in the White House press corps can stand up and say, uh, Mr. President, how is that any different from needing common sense judges who understand that our rights are derived from Poseidon or Zeus? Okay, that would be the, the last question that journalist ever asks. <laughs> And needless to say, we cannot possibly elect a president who openly doubts the existence of God, openly doubts the existence of a personal God who can hear our prayers, who takes an interest in our affairs. Seventy percent of Americans believe that it is important to have a president who is strongly religious. Over 50 percent of Americans claim to find atheists highly disagreeable. Now, I think we can all agree that if anyone was dying on account of Zeus, if people were organizing their lives around different dogmas about Mount Olympus, if books were being written trying to explain and constrain science in light of the Iliad and the Odyssey, this would be an obscene misuse of human life. I mean, it's, but it's not like someone figured out in the third century that Zeus doesn't exist, but the biblical God does. That's not a discovery that anyone made. This is the situation we are in. People are dying for an imaginary God, and we are not talking about it. I mean, you can read the, the newspaper for a year and not be reminded that the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians is a religious conflict. It is always framed as a conflict over land. It is only about land because the religious beliefs are incompatible. The, the theological claims on the real estate are incompatible. And moderates like yourselves are uniquely unable to appreciate the link between religious dogma and violence. You are blinded by your own moderation. When, when the jihadi looks into the video camera and says, we love death more than the infidel loves life, and then blows himself up, The religious dogmatists on our side, the Jerry Falwells of the world, they have no problem understanding that he was being quite candid. He really did have the courage of his convictions. This was not propaganda. He went to paradise, or th so he thought. It turns out he has the wrong religion. But he was after the 72 virgins. So one thing I argue in my book is that it's time we took these people at their word. They're telling us what they believe. And I don't know, I don't know how many architects and mechanical engineers need to hit the wall at 400 miles an hour before we take them at their word. So what is the alternative to religious faith? Now, there are two answers to this. First, the first answer is it's the wrong question to ask. Either God exists or he doesn't. If he doesn't exist, then we would be better off not believing in him. And what, what is the alternative to a belief in Santa Claus? The answer really is nothing. Now, it's not that a belief in Santa Claus was doing nothing for a child. You know, a child is entranced and consoled and interested and happy that Santa Claus exists. You take the belief away, you've taken something away. You haven't replaced it with something. But whatever conspired to make the belief untenable, perhaps he saw that it was his present, his, his parents wrapping the presents, the belief disappears and we all know that no one wants to be the last kid in class who believes in Santa Claus. 
And imagine how untenable the position of a child would be if he, if he claimed not to want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. He claimed to have found a, a moderate position on Santa Claus, and he could keep the sleigh and the elves, but, but jettison the guy in the suit. So the first answer to the question, what are the alternatives to faith? There don't have to be alternatives. If these beliefs are false, if they're untenable, we can relinquish them. As many countries in Western Europe have done, only 10% of Swedes, 10 to 15%, are believers of the sort we recognize in the States. Incidentally, 83% of Americans believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead. Now, I, again, it may seem insane, it may seem counterproductive. It's throwing the baby out with the bathwater to just say we can relinquish these beliefs without an alternative. But let me remind you about how easy it is to see the wisdom of this when we simply change the word God to Zeus. No one is feeling that we should be, maybe we should hold on to Zeus. You know, when we woke up the day after Christmas and turned on our televisions and saw that a killing wall of water had swept multitudes off the beaches of 12 countries, nobody said, you know, I think maybe we should be praying to Poseidon. You know, it's just, let's just cover our bases. But another way of answering this question is that, yes, clearly there are alternatives to faith. You know, whatever our spiritual possibilities are, they have to transcend culture and tradition. Whatever is true ultimately transcends culture and tradition. There is a very good reason why we don't talk about Christian physics or Muslim algebra. Though the Christians invented physics as we know it, as we know, the Jews brought it to the next level. But we don't talk about the cultural context in which these disciplines arose, because there really is a there there. They really are legitimate domains of knowledge that transcend culture. An experiment done in Los Angeles is going to work just like an experiment done in Baghdad if, it, in fact, it really is te teasing out some real truth about the nature of the world. Now, contemplatives in a variety of religious traditions have looked in to the connection between how we use our attention and human happiness, how we behave among others, ethics and human happiness. There's a lot of wisdom in our religious traditions on these subjects, but invariably this testimony is mingled with dogma. There's no doubt that doing the Jesus prayer for 18 hours a day is going to radically transform your moment-to-moment -moment experience of the world, very likely for the better. A Christian doing this practice will interpret these changes, these positive changes, as a confirmation of Christian dogma, as a confirmation of the idea that Jesus really was the Son of God, for instance. Now, it seems to me that there's a cure for this kind of provincialism. You only have to read about the identical experiences of Hindus to realize that the, the conclusion that Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God is not the best interpretation of the data, of your, even of, of your own experience as a Christian. So the challenge for us, as I see it, is to find ways, about ta ways for talking about our deepest personal concerns about the inevitability of death, about the inevitability of human suffering, about whatever we can do to transcend suffering, deepen communities, use ritual, to talk about all of this in terms 
that don't demand belief in anything on insufficient evidence. Because reason and evidence are our only link to one another. A fundamental openness to evidence is the only thing that guarantees the human conversation is truly open-ended. And that said, I'd like to thank you for listening to my side of it. Thank you very much. We're going to ask those who wish to ask questions to line up behind the microphone here. Uh, and uh, I'd like to begin, and then Reverend Swope of IUCC will be making, uh, will be asking a question, and then we really invite everyone here to comment. Uh, Sam, your, uh, your critique of religion was chillingly clear, very precise. Uh, I don't think anyone would doubt that most of it is true. Uh, I was thinking that uh, one line you used was even more provocative than your provocative title for your book. And you said, people are dying because of a belief in an imaginary God. That would have been a more provocative <laughs> title for the book. Uh, you spoke about religious moderates. That's about as far as you took it to the left. I would dare say that most of us in this room are religious liberals. Mm -hmm. and, and we think, most of us, we think of God the term God, many of, I don't want to say most because I don't know everybody in the room, but many of us think of God, that term is a metaphor for a force or power inside people that lead them to goodness, to being caring and loving people, as a path towards fulfillment, self-actualization, altruism. That's how God or godliness works through us. And we don't think of texts as coming from God, but rather being human products where human beings wrote those texts asserting what they thought was the highest and truest in their era. But for us, the texts raise questions, not give answers. We don't think of the Torah as a giant Ouija board, you know, that we open up and it has answers. So my question for you is, what should liberal religionists do in the face of these alarming numbers, statistics you quoted about the number of religious fundamentalists and some truly uh, scary beliefs about reality, what should liberal J Jews and Christians and people of other faiths do uh, to combat that level of what I would call spiritual ignorance? It might be religious faith, but it's spiritual and intellectual ignorance. Can you hear me for this one? Well, really what I, I'm arguing for, I, I'm, I'm arguing for a kind of intolerance. There, there's no way around it, but it is conversational intolerance. I'm arguing for new rules of conversation. You know, this is not the intolerance that gave us the gulag in the former Soviet Union. I'm not advocating that people be jailed for believing the wrong thing about God, but I'm arguing that the rules that apply in every other area of our lives apply on matters of faith, apply, apply on matters of, of spirituality and ethics and the kinds of claims people make under the aegis of religion. You take one example, stem cell research. Now, you can be a senator standing on the floor of the Senate saying things like, God creates life, man should not meddle in it. End, end of argument. That's the ethical argument. As I said, faith is a conversation stopper. As long as you don't have to give real reason and real arguments for your position, then the sky's the limit. You, just, you can stand in the way of what is undoubtedly one of the most promising lines in biology of research as far as generating medical therapies. And you can stand there smugly and stupidly as a college-educated politician and undoubtedly not lose any sleep over it. 
I mean, it's not that these people are, are sinister. They, they have their beliefs, but their, their beliefs are arising in a context that is not criticizing them, that is not putting them to the kinds of challenges that we put beliefs in any other area of our lives. So the, the stem cell research conversation should go more like this. We should talk about what these human embryos that will be destroyed in stem cell research really are. A human blastocyst, a three-day-old embryo, is a collection of 150 cells. That may sound like a lot of cells. There are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Okay, we're talking about 150 cells arranged in a sphere without any nervous system. These, this, this collection of cells is not discernibly human in any way apart from its genome. And the interests of these cells are being used to trump, really, the interests of little girls with diabetes and men and women with Parkinson's disease, people with full body burns, and, and, and a score of other, scores, really, of other conditions that could very likely be remediated if stem cell research proceeded completely without hindrance. Now, stem cell research is not outlawed, as you know. It's just being impeded by lack of funding. But 35% of Americans want it outlawed. 35% of Americans, you, know, you can raise the bar as high as you want on the side of benefit. And no matter what possible benefit we could get from stem cell research, those are, those are souls. Those blastocysts are, are fully in soul. And souls are equivalent. So what I'm arguing is that religious moderates can't stand for this discourse. And I think it's a, it's a very difficult game to play as a religious moderate, because as long as you want to dignify the claim that it makes sense to organize your life around the Bible, say, because it really is such a good book, uniquely inscribed in our tradition, uniquely wise, then you really have very little to, very little purchase on a criticism of the people who are going to take the Bible far more literally. Because the Bible doesn't say, don't take me literally on this. God doesn't say, when, when you get to the new world and you develop your three branches of government, you can jettison all the barbarism I talked about in Leviticus. Thanks, Sam. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Swope, pastor for the Interim and Irvine United Congregational Church. And, and uh, as an introduction, I want to say again to Arnie that we are thrilled to continue this long relationship and particularly to be part of this discussion. I would invite any of you who are interested in asking questions to begin forming a line at the microphones. It looks like Arnie and I are, are monopolizing things here, but we really don't mean to. Sam, I, I appreciate the enormous amount of research and, and thought that you put into this project. One of the things that we have been talking about at Irvine United Congregational is how we might begin really a conversation with uh, Christians of other faith styles, uh, fundamentalist Christians, evangelical Christians, because one of the things that we discover uh, on a regular basis as progressive liberal Christians is that we get shut down. Christianity is about X. It's about signing on to a list of belief statements uh, and you don't buy the whole package and you're damned for all eternity. And it seems to us that there ought to be some other way of, of, conce of conceptualizing our faith, but there ought to be a way to, to translate progressive religious concepts into a common language. And one of the things that, that, that I appreciate about your book and your comments is that you really throw it out there. But the thing that I'm concerned about um, with my own experience of discussion with, with fundamentalist and conservative Christians is that it's real easy to shut the dialogue off as well. And, and I fear that as constructive as you desire to be, um, 
that the door, uh, the door would easily be closed with the kind of approach that, that you seem to be taking. Right. How can we maintain an openness so that we begin, can begin to discuss and, and develop the kind of common uh, approach that you'd like to have? Right, right. <clears throat> well, I see your point. I've had uh, this attempt at dialogue that has been this book and, and subsequent communication about the book has demonstrated to me that, yeah, it, it, is a, it is a challenge, given how radical my criticism of faith, of faith is, to meet people. It's not a matter of meeting people halfway. I really, as you see, this, I really think it's an all or nothing game here. And I think that we have 50 years to, uh, 50 years more or less, to sort this out. Given the, given the spread of, of, uh, of the weapons of, of mass destruction and just disruptive technology. You know, just, just the ability to write a computer virus that confounds a country for some days. You know, this, we are being so pressed together by technology now. And this, that the pace of this consolidation of our world is only increasing. So I, I don't think we have a lot of time, and I am mindful of how of the effect of my criticism on people. And the truth is, I think it would be a terrible thing if the president of the United States suddenly started speaking the way I speak. I mean, we cannot. He, the president cannot get up and say, "We're at war with Islam." I got news for you. But we need a clear appraisal of our situation in the world. And I don't hear that appraisal coming from religious moderates and religious liberals. And I don't see the purchase point theologically where they can stand and say, listen guys, you have it wrong because your interpretation is, is false. Because that, that's really what it is. There, there's nothing more sacred than the facts. There's nothing more sacred than the truth and we have rival conceptions of what is true. Religious fundamentalists really think that God is letting people fly planes into our buildings because we're tolerating gay marriage. Okay, so it seems to me that to combat that, you really need a place to stand where you can argue about, about how unseemly that view of the world is in, in logical terms, in factual terms, and in moral terms. But and uh, this is where I, I think you're, you're going, uh, and this is really where I can meet you halfway. I think there is a, a huge role for people who talk the talk you talk. I mean, that, that, that my language is not really fashioned for export very well. And, 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 and we need religious moderates who find some way to articulate the traditional game of religion in ways that are not offensive to reason and in ways that do not distort our social policy. But it, it has to be much more radical than it seems to be. And, it, you know, it's a real challenge. I, I am someone who wrote this book and gives talks like this really without any hope that I'm going to make a bit of difference. I mean, there's just no, I, I just can't. I, this, these are the noises I make when I open my mouth, but there's, there's, it's not based on any expectation that it's really going to change the world in any sense at all. Well, I, I hope you do make a difference. You mentioned that 10% of people in Sweden are believers and that the trend in Europe seems to be going in a more secular direction. Could you talk a little bit about why in this country the trend seems to be in the opposite direction, if that's true, and why, why that is. Right. Well, the trend, you know, religiosity, fundamentalist religiosity, became very visible, obviously, in this last election. But the trend has really been stable for many, many years. We, the Gallup polling on religious conviction in this country has really been flat for 80 years or so since they've, they've been doing it. The, you ask questions like, do you believe that Satan literally exists? 65% of Americans say yes. And that's been true, you know, give or take a few percentage points for, for decades. So 
Uh, the question about Sweden and, and Western Europe in general is interesting. There, there are some theories about it. I don't know what really explains it. One, one theory is that when you have state religions, when you have no marketplace that, that requires the, the, the competition among denominations, then religion kind of gets ossified and uncharismatic and people stop going to church. Whereas here, we have this marketplace of religions and everyone is hanging up a shingle and then you have this vibrant uh, you know, ecosystem of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> to mix metaphors therapy. Thanks. But I, I'm, I'm not entirely satisfied with that hypothesis about Western Europe. Yeah, Sam, thank you uh, for, for all this. I'm one of your, one of your pen pals on email. I based uh, part of my um, dissertation on it, my essay paper on you. Uh, for a, uh, a secular humanist such as myself, what value, if any, does the uh, Bible have in, in our lives, in my life? Well, I think it has the same value as Shakespeare has. It's not written as well. Well, yeah, well, parts of it are written very well. It's, you know, Shakespeare, this is a, a line in my book, but I, you know, it's, it's strange that, Shakespeare, that God made Shakespeare a better writer than himself. So that should be a problem for us. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's literature. I would look at it as literature. Okay, thanks. And, and there's a lot of wisdom in it. You know, the, Bible, the Bible would not be the Bible. It would not have influenced us as much as it has, if, it, if there were nothing in there. Well, it's a moral template, but uh, I wonder if it's a good template, really. Well, you, you take Jesus in half his moods, and it's, it's about as good as you get. You know, the, the golden rule, and uh, much of what was said on the mount, is that it's you know, Jesus, the, the, the literary Jesus, if that was, in fact, the historical Jesus, th there's no doubt that Jesus was a spiritual genius. There's no doubt that he had realized something really profound about the link between ethics and spiritual experience. But he's one of thousands. You know, this is the other thing that's quite surprising. When you get into Eastern religion, when you read the, the Buddhist canon, you, it, it's just the wealth of testimony about compassion and about uh, the possibilities of ordinary people realizing the most profound insights that any mystic ever articulated. This is, has been sketched out in the East in a way that is really quite comprehensive. And, uh, and there, there are shards of that in every tradition. You know, in Islam, you have Rumi, the great Sufi poet, who was an absolute genius and clearly seeing the world with shocking clarity and occasionally mentioning the Quran or, or Allah as his, the touchstone for his vision. But there's just this, there's a capacity of the human mind to realize deeper and redeeming truths about the, the present moment. Uh, and every one of our religions has been the, the vehicle of discussing that those kinds of realizations, but there is so much other Stuff. dogmatism and so many other commitments, ideological commitments in these traditions that, uh, you know, the, if the baby's in that backwater, uh, it's not doing too well. Okay. Thanks. Hello, thank you for coming to speak with us this evening. Um, I have a few questions hoping you can articulate on them, though sure. I don't have a fully organized question. I'm just going to kind of throw things out, if that's okay, and do what you will with them. Sure. Um, my first comment or question is, you, you mentioned that spirituality must transcend culture. Uh, and you also mentioned the benefit of perhaps, of perhaps of community and whatnot. Uh, is there a viable future for a community-based spirituality that is expressed other than a religious organization that perhaps could uh, project a universal maxim or whatever around the world, at best achieving a universal utopia, and most more realistically perhaps uh, achieving open dialogue. Can you think of any opportunity that would come about for that, for perhaps 
liberal people like ourselves who are more religious persuaded. And my second question is um, going along the idea of perhaps Eastern Buddhist philosophies being healthier or more advanced than Western, um, given the fact that there, there are some expressions of Buddhist fundamentalism that we see, including patriarchy and misogynistic expressions, mm -hmm. and also secular ideologies and their uh, disruptive technology, perhaps, that in general they sell to religious fundamentalists. So to tie things up, my main question is, if religion is accountable for religious fundamentalism, can secularism be accountable for secular ideological fundamentalism that we get perhaps in Lenin and Stalin or Nazism or whatever right. that have right. been responsible for so many wars? So, okay. I think. Yeah, good. Um, I'll take your last question first. <clears throat> Clearly, I am not claiming that religion is the only source of violence. People have killed one another for perfectly secular reasons and will continue to, no doubt. Now, it's often, this, this, the challenge to my thesis is often raised that the worst offenders in the genocide game have been secular ideologies, Nazism, Stalinism, communist China. My pirouette on this subject is really I'm arguing against dogma. You know, religion just has more than its fair share of dogma. I'm, I'm arguing against unsubstantiated beliefs to which people hold in the face of any contrary evidence. So taking that heuristic, you look at Stalinism, you see very quickly, Stalinism was not a rational enterprise. This is not what happens to people when they get too rational. And Nazism, I mean, Heinrich Himmler thought that the Aryans had descended from outer space and were preserved in ice since the beginning of time, and he created a meteorological division of the Reich to go look for this ice evidence. These are not highly rational people. This, the the pseudoscience that, that was the basis of Nazism this sort of weird tweak on Darwinism, and all of this, all this religion, really, of pure-blooded Germanism, and all of this was a kind of religion, really. It was a political religion. It just didn't, it just wasn't otherworldly. And the same is true of, of Stalinism. So, <clears throat> one thing I say in my book is that when you see people killing mass numbers of non-combatants, intentionally killing non-combatants, committing genocide. Ask yourself what these people believe. I think you will find that it is always preposterous. This is, this is practically a truism because there's just no good reason to kill non-combatants indiscriminately. Now, the other issue of community and you asked about Buddhist, uh, the possibility of, of Buddhism or Eastern philosophy inspiring violence. There's an example, the, the uh, kamikaze pilots were inspired by a very perverse Zen uh, form of otherworldliness. And you know, there were Rinzai Zen masters basically signing off on their kamikaze mission. So the Buddhism is not exempt. And there are lots of weird stories about theocracy in Tibet and uh, there, there are, my faith is that you, you can put your faith in, it seems to me you can only put your faith in the human conversation. And the question is, are you going to put your faith in the 21st century human conversation? Or are you going to get in your time machine and go back and put your faith in some other century's conversation? In the 7th century, if you're a Muslim, or the, you know, way back if you're a Christian or a Jew. I mean, really, the Iron Age. Uh, so it really, in community, is, community is all we have. The science is just is a, complete, is a communal enterprise. All we have is dialogue. And it seems to me that the, the rules of dialogue should not change from discipline to discipline, when, when the truth is what's being talked about. <clears throat> 
Thank you for coming. If you were suddenly in the position of advising the President of the United States on policy. God forbid. <laughs> how would your positions inform what you would advise him or her to do with regard to the current status of conflict, let's say, in the Middle East? Well, I've actually thought about this. Uh, yeah, my, posi my position really cuts across ideological lines, and it's, it's very strange for me to talk about my book in the media, because you know, you'll, I'll get on a, a right-wing AM talk show, and everything I say about Islam, they just love it. You know, then I turn the spotlight on Christianity, and we run <laughs> completely into the ditch. Then I get on liberal radio, and everything I say about Islam, they just, they just recoil at it. It's way too politically incorrect, but I turn the spotlight on Christianity, and they love it. So we are really quite stratified here, and my argument cuts across that. It's really orthogonal to right and left, and uh, I'm not a pacifist. I think there really are people in this world who are beyond conversation at this point. Osama bin Laden is a great example. I don't think there's anything we're going to say to him that is going to basically change his orientation. Uh, now, what subset, to speak specifically about the war on terror and the, the problem in the Middle East, we have an issue with Islam and the West, Islam and, and Jews. We have an issue with, with Jew, the Jewish settlers. I mean, the, the Jewish settlers, their, their theological claims on that real estate have to be completely repudiated by the Israeli government. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a great supporter of Israel, really only because of the anti-Semitism of the rest of the world. And the only thing that, that justifies the existence of Israel is the omnipresence of anti-Semitism. Otherwise, Israel, it, it is a, an obnoxious idea to have a state organized around a religion. So, uh, the short answer is I think that we have to, one, acknowledge the role that religion is playing. We have to solicit the involvement of moderate Muslims wherever they exist. If, we, if they don't exist, we have to create them. Uh, you know, we're all very hopeful that, that the vast, vast majority of Muslims are, are exquisitely moderate and, and would just repudiate everything that Osama bin Laden stands for. I think that's far too hopeful. We, we have to find some way of winning a war of ideas with Islam or, get, or getting a subset of the Muslim world to win a war of ideas with itself. And what is one thing that is incredibly clear now, given that George Bush is in charge for four more years, is that we cannot do this alone. And we have alienated even our allies. So to take an, an example like Iraq, intelligent people could disagree about whether it was the right thing to, to do to go into Iraq. But one thing is, is pretty clear. Going in, we should have gone in with everybody. I mean, we need a truly international effort. We need to convince civilized democracies everywhere that civilization itself has genuine enemies these totalitarian, theocratic, tribal eruptions in many parts of the globe on a hundred fronts. Many, most at this moment, are, are Muslim. Uh, so it's just we need a part of the problem, but part of the reason why we are so isolated from the rest of the world, from our allies, is our own religiosity. I mean, we look incredibly retrograde from the perspective of Western Europe, our erstwhile allies in Western Europe, we look like a deranged theocracy in the making with all the bombs. It, it, we have to be terrifying to the rest of the world. So until we put our own house in order, it, it seems to me that you know, we, we're hardly the, the kingdom of reason to be clubbing everyone over the head saying, uh, you can't be theocrats anymore. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, you stated that as moderates, 
uh, our rationalization of the Bible is improper, that we really should face the fact that that's wrong. I agree with you that it's a rationalization, and I agree with you that the Christians who are doing the same thing are rationalizing. There are also Muslims who I've heard rationalize in the same way. Mm -hmm. the, I, I happen to dialogue with many different religions, and what I find is that what moderates can do is dialogue. We can dialogue by talking about the similarities in each religion, the schizophrenic God that's really good, and not the one that's bad. Right. And we do look for the good in our religions, we look for the similarities in that good, and I think it's a binding influence and perhaps can grow. Uh, do you think that maybe that kind of thing would, could happen? Well, this touches Steve's question. I think it, it should grow, it has to grow. It's the most likely approach, given what everyone believes. But I also think that it's not good enough. I think it, it has to unwind itself, ultimately, because the religions are not the same, really. And the fundamentalists really have no reason to listen to the moderates. You know, the moderate discourse is not so compelling that the fundamentalists are going to wake up and say, whoa, they, they're really onto something. You know, the, the fundamentalists read the books. You know, they know what's in the books. It's, that's, that's certainly true of fundamentalists, but what I'm saying is, uh, do you feel that there could be a growing movement among moderates in all the religions, seeing all this bloodshed and seeing the ridiculousness of the wars? One would hope, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it's clearly moderates are better than fundamentalists. I mean, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd make us all moderates. There's no, you know, that would be no hesitation. It's just... It's interesting to consider the example of a place like Sweden, where it's, it's beyond being moderate. They're really people who are living uh, virtually in an atheistic state. And they're the most, gen as far as the, the, their level of altru altruism, they, they are among the most generous nations in the world. You know, it's not like they're just holed up there and, and, and uh, their atheism has somehow sapped them of moral vigor and they have, I mean, almost every leading indicator of, of the health of a nation, apart from suicide, incidentally, and I would attribute the light up there and, and the cold to that, but everything else, literacy and infant mortali mortality and, and gender issues and uh, violent crime, the top 20 atheist nations are, are the best on all those UN indices. And the worst nations are inevitably theocracies. So this idea that somehow, without religious dogmatism, however undogmatic, we, we're going to lose the, the fiber of society uh, or, or personal morality, I, I think there's no evidence for that. Now, we're going to give you the last question. But there will be time at the reception afterwards for people to come up informally and speak to Mr. Harris. Sam, you've been talking about the book and talking about others. How about yourself? Okay, what's your background and what brought you to this topic and why the interest in this topic? Well, the topic, I literally started writing this book on September 12, 2001. It was my immediate reaction to that event. Uh, it just so happened I had been spending a lot of time studying religion and studying the, what seemed to me to be the, the rational alternative to religious faith. I was very interested in meditation and, and uh, that interest brought me into neuroscience and I'm, I'm now studying the brain basis of belief. I'm looking for the difference in a brain, in a, in a living human being. Right? We do this with what's called functional MRI. Uh, the difference between a person who believes and disbelieves a proposition, irrespective of, of what that proposition is, whether it's religious, whether it's math. Uh, and so I'm very interested in, in just what belief is at the, at the level of the brain. And okay, so before 9-11, did you have a belief system? Did you have faith? Um, you know, did you have religion? Were you involved in religion? 
and, and at what level, and then did you change prior to that, and then all of a sudden 9-11 really put you over the edge? That's my, right. my question is, what happened be before that? Okay. Well, I was raised in a very secular household. My mother gave me a choice at the age of 10. Uh, Sam, do you want to go to Sunday school like your friends? And I said no, and that basically sealed my fate as far as being bar mitzvahed was concerned. Um, but I, I have been always, I've been interested in religion from you know my my teenage years and got very into Buddhism and Hindu meditation at a certain point. Made many trips to India and Nepal and spent probably two years on silent meditation retreats. Just well, you just meditate. You do nothing but meditate for 12, 18 hours a day. So I, I, I the concerns of of the faithful and a, a seeker is a spiritual experience are really well known to me not, not so much in a Jewish context but I, you know I at various points I was a, a dogmatic Buddhist and a dogmatic Hindu believing all manner of of nonsense really from my point of view now uh, but this is not to say that I, I think we have all the mysteries solved but there are fundamental mysteries about the nature of this universe and I am quite open to the data. I've been pilloried by atheists for a few footnotes in my book that declare an open-mindedness to data on psychic phenomenon and, and other spooky things that most scientists don't want to touch. But there, there is data there. And it seems to me that we just can't close our accounts, as, as James said, with reality until we, we fully uh, vet all the data. So anyway, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. It's not too late for that bar mitzvah, Sam. <laughs> Do it now. <laughs> there, wa there, was, there was a young woman standing behind Ellen, and I, and I would like to ask her to come up again and give her the last question. All right, so. Because she was patiently waiting. I have two questions for you, one for my friend and one for me. Um, Based on your statistics about voting for a president because of religion, do you think that we are violating the law of the separation of church and state? No, I don't think we're violating the law, but I just don't think the law is good enough. I, I, think, the, I think belief is more powerful and inevitable than any law is going to protect us from. If, if people really believe that God wrote one of our books,